Yeah. Um, and what you had, of course, was you had um, things that that were comfortable for people who had returned from World War II. Mm. You had the Father Knows Best. You have the um, um, Nelson family. All these things where you have this ideal home situation, which is what a lot of people were hoping to achieve when they got back from the war. So yeah, the fifties were a rough time and some, a lot of the movies out of the fifties are pretty shabby in a lot of respects. Um, but then the sixties moves ahead. And one of the cats, I'm, I'm talking, I, Judy, do you want me to stop and go to the program? I'm just answering <laughs> questions, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, know, you might as well just keep right on going because I got your recording, so. <laughs> Well, um, what happened, I think, that made a huge difference in the 60s is foreign films came in. Foreign movies came into popularity in the 60s, and they were not concerned about cinema. They were not concerned about family, uh, cute family situations. They were much more dramatic, much more powerful and strange compared to what Americans were used to seeing. And so um, then uh, American filmmakers started to emulate that kind of thing. Um, the film noir came into popularity out of France, uh, French filmmaking. And um, you're talking about uh, Ingmar Bergman and Federico Fellini and these people's movies coming in in the 60s. Um, some extraordinary films with subtitles and Americans going to actually pay money to sit there and read the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, it was a change in times and the 50s suffered. They were sort of the in-between uh, yeah. decade. Hmm. Well, I was gonna say, I remember in, going, in college, um, 65, 66 in there when we went, or even uh, right after that, when we went to the West Town and saw those oh, great yes. movies at the West Town, or at um, Central, um, the other small theater, Broadway, or no, there was another smaller theater there at Central, and we saw all these British movies with Terry Thomas and Peter Sellers, and well, um, just great. I had a similar thing happen to me, but again, um, movies have always been a big industry with an audience that has certain anticipation. And in the 50s, the late 50s, leading in early 60s, Saginaw, that's, for those of you who don't know, that's a city uh, 20 miles away, had the teeniest theater. I doubt that it seated 100 people. But it was called the World Theater, and they showed only foreign films. Uh, well, no, that's not true, because that's the first place I ever saw Greta Garbo. Um, but they, uh, they had uh, the um, uh, Mr. Hulot's, um, all of his series of films, Jacques Tati, uh, the French actor. Um, they had uh, uh, Jean-Paul Belmondo, all of these things. But there were, I don't know how they kept open. I know the man because he had two theaters in Bay City and his wife was very active in Bay City Players. Um, but um, it was really, it was very special. Um, but uh, eventually he simply had to close because he couldn't afford it. Well, if you okay, please, if you want to go ahead and start. Okay. I'm Judy from the Association of Lifelong Learners and are you with we're here with Leeds Bird, and I'm going to let him go ahead and take over. Well, I had a nice time with you last month, and I'm back again. I'm from Bay City, uh, talking to you and Alpina. And um, I really should qualify. Uh, basically, this has been referred to the golden age of Hollywood. And really, I've tried to make it... The, TCM and the golden age of Hollywood with the intention that if you know more about movies from this particular golden age, 
Uh, and if you watch TCM, you might find ways to be more selective in what you're going to see, or you might find ways to experiment uh, with studios or performers that you think may have a kind of thing that you would enjoy. But before I do that, I have a disclaimer, okay? Had one last time, have one this time. I will state fact, I will state opinion. I have no responsibility for either the fact or the opinion. Those who agree with me are to be commended. Those who disagree with me are to be forgiven. Barbara Stanwyck has been my favorite actress for over 70 years, and I reserve the right to reference her or her career at any time in spite of what Kay Breckenridge may think. If these conditions are agreeable to you, stay tuned. If not, go watch the news. Now, what I was saying is that um, TCM is wonderful, 24 seven, showing movies, every kind of movie you can possibly imagine and getting very organized. They've never been this organized before. Um, but I think things that are happening politically and socially are influencing um, the kind of movies they want to show. So in a lot of cases, it's not just catch as catch can. In a lot of cases, they have set programs up. So for instance, recently they ran during the course of a month, every Tuesday, they ran films directed by women. And um, they were women from all over the world not a lot of American women because America has a, a really rather limited number of them, but um, they would preface these with comments on uh, the situation for women in their country and um, the kind of things that were being presented from a woman's perspective. And it was, it was fascinating. On a regular basis, they have a series called Film Noir. And um, that is, um, I don't know how to describe it to you, if you don't know what it is. It came over from France, late 40s. Um, Double Indemnity is often considered the pinnacle of Film Noir. A lot of people consider the Maltese Falcon. It's movies where the good guy is not a good guy, where the woman is usually a seductress, where the lighting is dim and often in American film noir shot through Venetian blinds, so you have slats of light. Uh, and there's a lot of cigarette smoke and people are always doing the other person in. Um, but anyway, what I'm saying is TCM has such a huge variety that if you, become acquainted with them. And I'll talk to you about how you might do that later. Um, you can actually go after those kinds of things that you're interested in. But one of the things that will help, I think, is for us to talk about the golden age of movies. The golden age, oh, cripe, what is the golden age? I uh, submitted uh, 1935 to 1955. Uh, but ages are just an arbitrary judgment. Um, can anyone tell me the day on which the age of reason began? No. How about the Bronze Age? Do you know what day of the week it ended? No. Now, there are some ages that are a little more uh, sensible. I'll say, for instance, the Napoleonic era. It's obvious it begins with Napoleon, it ends with Napoleon. Um, the Edwardian period in England. But for the most part, when we talk about ages or eras or periods, we're talking about an event or several people who create something that goes on to become bigger and bigger until it pretty much reaches a popularity peak. And then it starts to fade out as the next age comes in. Now, the golden age of movies is not really 1935, 1955. Basically, it's usually referred to as 1933 to 1935. Now, why do I say that? Why do I, I thought 1935 to 1933 sounded better. But the catch is in 19, 1930, 
three, censorship came in. Now there was censorship before in movies, way back, um, way, way, way back in the silence. Um, there was no such thing. But then studios started to take, you see what movies really began in Europe, uh, quite especially France is credited with a great deal of that with experimental films. Um, and they led to movies being created. Uh, well, Thomas Edison was a smart man and he caught on quickly to what was going on with movies. So in the United States, movies took place in the work filmed in New Jersey and then in New York. And New York and New Jersey was the center of the movie industry when it first began in America. However, California offered changes of locale. They offered good weather almost all year long. They offered deserts, they offered mountains, they offered the ocean, they offered farmland and all within reasonable distance of Los Angeles. So studios picked up from the East Coast, room, they go out to the West Coast, dozens and dozens and dozens. And many of them simply had, well, basically a warehouse, a camera, a cameraman, they hired some actors, painted some scenery, there was your movie. And that's the way it went for a long time. Of course, we're talking silent movies. But out of all that, essentially grew eight movie studios. Eight studios that determined virtually everything. All the big stuff, all the good stuff. Most of what's remembered today as Hollywood movies out of this time period came from these eight studios. Now, Oh, and by the way, I have notes because I, I don't want to skip anything that I think you should know. Um, the whole thing about movies is that America was really locked into them. America loved movies. In our town of Bay City, when I was, um, when I was a kid growing up, our town of 30,000, give or take, had nine or 10 movie theaters. Now, maybe four or five of them were downtown. They were what they called the first run movie theaters. They were theaters where they charged you more and they only showed you one movie. But the city was filled with neighborhood movie theaters. And if you went to a neighborhood movie theater, you saw two features, you saw um, a cartoon, you saw a newsreel, you saw previews of the movies that would be coming up next week. And um, sometimes they might even have an amateur performance of music or whatever on a stage. So it was easy growing up, I saw at least four movies a week and many times more than that because the movies were there and the movies were easy to get to. My mother says that I saw my first movie lying across her lap at the Tivoli Theater in Bay City. And she said, I didn't kick up a fuss at all during the whole thing. Now my mother sat on the aisle, so I imagine I had a pretty good view and um, it was easy enough. But movies have always been a part of my life. And fortunately for me, I was born in 1935. 1935 to 1955, that's my birth and my completion, my second year in college, all right? So there's just so much of what I'm talking about that has been a part of my background. Um, and I think, um, I think that for a lot of people, well, they know movies, they went occasionally, they didn't have a great deal of interest out of going for the recreation on that Friday night or Saturday night or Sunday afternoon. Um, and that's good, but that also leaves this vacancy that I'm talking about of people who don't know anything about the studios who are really responsible for the movies and how good or how poor they were, and also the performers within them. So that's what we're going to look at. Um, 
the um, uh, the golden age as as it is usually defined. Now I said we go back to 1933. Prior to that, there was censorship. First of all, there was none. Then the public started to get upset. So the studio said, hey, don't worry, we'll censor our own movies. <laughs> How ridiculous is that? They're not going to take anything out that's going to prevent them getting box office. But by the time we got to 1933, major forces came into being, which led to a censorship board, first of all, run by um, Hayes, and then run by Breen. And during this time, the Catholic Church established the Legion of Decency, which evaluated every movie and gave it a rating. And if it condemned a movie, Catholics were not supposed to go see it. So that was almost a, a, a death mark uh, for movies that were condemned. And so the movie studios decided, okay, we'll work our way around that. And that censorship led to some of the best things in movies you can see. They're charming uh, because, well, today, oh, Christ, I watched the series Outlander. I stopped watching. I was so tired of seeing her breast and his bugs over and over, episode after episode. How many times can you see that? Also, when people semi-naked, lean against each other and fall back on the bed. I don't need to see anymore. I know what's going on, but they don't stop there. So during, the, um, during this time period, none of that ever happened. Nudity was virtually non-existent. However, the attraction between men and women was still very strong and pictured beautifully. Um, Roger Ebert, I don't know if you know Roger Ebert, he was one of the significant movie critics in the United States for a long time until he passed away. He said in a book he wrote that he felt that the uh, five and a half, the sexiest five and a half minutes that he'd ever seen in any movie were the scene in The Lady Eve between Barbara Stanwyck and Henry Fonda. Now, let me describe it to you. Um, Barbara Stanwyck is a card shark on a cruise ship. And Henry Fonda is a nerd coming in from uh, the Amazon to, um, he studies snakes. And uh, they meet, I won't go into the details, they meet, they go down to, um, <clears throat> For some reason, uh, again, details, they wind up in her dressing room and uh, they leave, nothing happens there except some tantalizing leg show from Stanwyck. And then they're going down the hallway and, oh, look at it. this happens to be his stateroom. So they go in and she's operating on him all she can, trying to be seductive. And he says, oh, Emma got out. What's Emma? Oh, that's my whatever it is, snake, snake, ah, she runs screaming down the hall, down the flight of stairs, into her room, he's right behind her, check under the bed, check in the bed, oh, come over here, I'm so upset, and she goes over, and she sits on a chaise lounge, he sits next to her, and then she leans against him, and he slides off the lounge onto the floor, she is now reclined on a chaise lounge. You know what those are, right? They're a couch where one end goes up. Um, she is now uh, lying down on that. He's on the floor trying to hold himself up. And they're engaged in conversation. He attempts to get off, but she's not cooperating. She puts her arm over his shoulder and she touches his head and she tells him how all the awful thing. And they go on and on the conversation as she's running her fingers through his hair and wrapping her finger around his ear and going in his ear as they talk about their ideal mates. And she is, she is not acting aggressive to him. She knows exactly what she's doing. This tantalizing and him getting so upset. Finally, by the time it's through with just the dialogue and the two superb actors, she gets up and she said, oh, I think I'm all right now. And what we hear from Henry Fonda is, 
I wish I could say the same thing. There's a scene in a movie called The More the Merrier, which I think is so clever, I couldn't. The More the Merrier takes place in Washington, D.C. during World War II, when there's a housing shortage. Gene Arthur has an apartment of some size. So Gene Arthur rents half of her apartment to Charles Coburn, an old man, okay? An old man, a young woman, it's okay. Now, Charles Coburn works nights. So he rents his apartment, uh, half of his apartment, to Joel McRae, a young man who works days. Gene Arthur, Joel McRae get to know each other. And this is a scene I'm talking about. He takes her out to dinner and they constantly are denying any attraction between each other. He takes her out to dinner. And now we're coming back from dinner. We're walking down the street in front of the apartment building where their apartment is. And because it's World War II, you'll see a sailor kissing a girl over here in this corner. You'll see a Marine and a girl leaning up against the tree saying sweet nothings to each other. You'll see all of this while Joel McRae and Jean Arthur walk down the street. Now, don't ask me why she wore an evening gown to go out to dinner with Joel McRae. This wasn't that fancy. But she has a strapless evening gown on, which means totally bare shoulders. She has a fur stole with her. And uh, as they walk down the street, talking once again, uh, the same way that Fonda and Stanwyck did, not about themselves or anything personal. But as they talk, all of a sudden, um, Jean Arthur's stole slips off her shoulder and Joel McRae's hand is resting on her shoulder. Oh, she shrugs it off like that. How'd that get there? And then um, he takes that and he puts it back. And as they go, his hand takes a life of its own. It's on top of the stole. It's under the stole. The stole falls off. The stole goes back on. But never do they acknowledge anything. They engage in their conversation. But you can see it's affecting the two of them. Finally, they get to the doorstep. They sit on the doorstep. They talk. They're both very attracted to the other at this point, but they're not letting anything happen. And Jean Arthur goes up the stairs to uh, say good night. And she stands in the doorway and she says good night to Joel McRae, closes the door. He says good night to her before she does. He turns around, takes two steps and stops and says, hey, I live there. Totally, and you are drawn right into it. It never dawns on you, this kind of thing. He goes up um, and they're both in their separate rooms. They've just gone through this somewhat um, attractive attraction to each other. They both go to bed. Now, you are not allowed to be in the same bed, obviously, in this, they're in two different apartments, but where are the beds? Here, the camera goes outside the apartment, looking in through two windows. There is a wall. And here's Gene Arthur's bed against the wall. Here's Joel McRae's bed against the wall. And you see them um, dealing with the conversation that, but personally by themselves, dealing with the conversation that took place. It turned out to be a big thing in Pillow Talk many years later. What is Pillow Talk? 70s movie, probably. Um, maybe even an 80s movie when Rock Hudson is in a bathtub, Doris Day is in a bathtub, and they put their feet on the wall between them. And then what happens is Rock Hudson lowers his foot as if he's scratching his foot against the wall, and Doris Day immediately pulls her foot back as if she can feel it. Well, they're in tubs in different rooms in different parts of the city. That's an interesting approach to, to the kind of censorship that was prominent in the 1930s, uh, 40s, and uh, middle, up to the mid 50s. But what they really should have said was they were not censoring the movies. The studios were censoring themselves. Now, out of all those, that multitude of studios that went out to California, as I said, eight of them became the studios that were responsible for most. There were five called, uniquely enough, the big five. And there were three called, uniquely enough, the little three. 
We'll talk about them. And when you see their name come up for a movie, you, there are certain things you can expect. Now, first of all, I have to tell you, nothing I say is 100% accurate or true. Because if I tell you MGM gave you this kind of movie and Paramount gave you this kind of movie, it's true. But they also gave you every other kind of movie because that's how they made money. But certain things established their reputation so that generally an MGM movie, you could expect this. Generally, a Warner Brothers movie, you could expect this, okay? So that's what we'll look at first with those. Um, the, um, let's start with Paramount. Uh, did, well, I don't know, did I give you that? Well, it doesn't matter, you're not answering me. I can't remember if I gave you the names of the studios or not, but I will right now. The big five, MGM, Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Paramount Pictures. Now, a lot of these exist today, but they're not these studios. They have been purchased. Their facilities have been purchased by conglomerates who own not only Paramount, but they also own Kentucky Fried Chicken and Taco Bell, okay? Huge conglomerates. So they have a totally different feeling about what they show as movies. The people who ran the studios felt personal obligation. This represented Louis B. Mayer. He didn't want to be insulted by some piece of trash that wasn't any good. Are you kidding? Jack Warner for Warner Brothers, he wanted to make money, but he knew he had to do it within these confines. So that's what he did. So <clears throat> there is a difference between these names applying today and what they were like back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So Metro Golden Mayor, Paramount Pictures, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, you see that all the time. You see their logo, 20th Century Fox emblazoned on top of some pedestal and these searchlights going in front of it. It has nothing to do with these people except the name. Um, and I don't know how it got there, but one of the big five was RKO Studios. But when I look at it, I can pretty much understand, okay. Um, but I guess what I look at is after Howard Hughes bought RKO Studios, he managed to destroy it. Um, very egotistical man, very strange man. If you know anything at all about Howard Hughes, extremely rich, extremely idiosyncratic, and um, just a force to be dealt with. It was his money, he could do what he wanted to with it, and he did. Now the little three are Columbia, Universal, and United Artists. So let's take a look at what these studios were too. Um, the big five were the big five, not because they produced the best movies, not because they produced the highest quality movies, they were the big five because of business. Now, let me get this right. I don't want to read this wrong to you. There's a book published in 1988. It's called An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Made Hollywood by Neil Gabler, or Gabler. He accredits much of the success of seven of these eight studios because Eight of them were all run by Jewish men. 20th Century Fox, once Fox left, um, Daryl Zanuck took over. And Gabler points out in the history of all those um, seven men, they were fatherless, they were immigrants, and they all fell out of place in the United States. And in going into the movie business and developing their own studios, they created a world of their own where they were the father figures to all these people, the stars and everybody else under contract. And in addition, they could create the United States they wanted. And in most cases, you will see movies during this time, even disastrous movies, the bad guys get punished in the end, one way or another. Rarely will you see a movie where the crooks succeed. 
rarely will you see a movie where um, a murderer or murderess um, goes free because they were creating an ideal world. And they had a business acumen that Gabler thought was extraordinary. And this is what we're talking about with that business acumen. I'll hit all five of them, then I'll go back and try and explain a little bit. One, the big five had bigger and uh, more studios. I'll get with that. They had distribution divisions. They had substantial theater chains. They contracted lots of performers and film personnel. Now, what's that mean? Okay, I don't know what you know about movie making. So when I say they have more and bigger studios, what am I talking about? They have a piece of property in Los Angeles. And that piece of property can vary in size. They can have lakes on that property. It can be huge, gigantic. Jaws was shot on Universal International in a lake they created. Uh, not all of it. A lot of it is in the real ocean, but a lot of it that is in that, um, in that lake they created. But what you wind up with is a stage that is, a, pardon me, a building with nothing in it that is the size of a football field and four and five stories tall with nothing in it so they can put whatever they want to in it. And you can have one or two of those, but studios like MGM would have a dozen of them. So they were shooting movies in all of these and they were able to do the special things that made their film special because there was enough room to do it and they were able to do it economically because in the studio, in that literal building, they could control things. They could control climate. They didn't have to wait for the sun to come up to have a sunrise. They created a sunrise. And they, this whole kind of thing is what I'm explaining with studios. Let me give you a couple examples. I assume a lot of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life. If you've seen that Jimmy Stewart movie at Christmas, you recognize Main Street is very important. People are always walking down Main Street to go to the bank, to go home, to go to the library, to go to the restaurant, all off Main Street. Then there's a point in the movie where Jimmy Stewart is standing on a bridge looking down into a river. He's going to commit suicide. Ding, there's a sound next to him. Here is Clarence the Angel. They get engaged in conversation. Jimmy Stewart says, oh, my life is terrible. It wasn't worth anything. I'm going to end it. And Clarence says, oh, no, your wife's life's more valuable. I'll tell you what, I'll give you a chance to go back and look. So he does. And look at what it would be, first of all, as if Jimmy Stewart had not existed. He goes down the street. Everything's terrible. Sleazy bars. People that he knew are bums on the street. He bumps into the woman who would become his wife in real life, but now if he hadn't existed, she would be this stereotypical, of course, but they're very tight, very nervous librarian. Um, there are all these horrible things that would have happened if he hadn't. Now, he goes back, Clarence is there and says, okay, now go back. And he goes down the main street again and he's joyous. Snow is falling, people are celebrating. There are no sleazy bars. People are successful and happy, and he goes home. Now that street is built in a studio. They're not, there's no real street. Those buildings that you see are all facades. When he goes through at night, they light it for night. They, everything is under control. I'm not finding fault with this. I'm simply telling you that's how they make their movies. That's how they had control. That's how they made money. Additionally, they could bring the outside in. I'll use a Barbara Stanwyck movie from Christmas since we just left a Christmas movie. A movie called A Christmas in Connecticut. Now, what you have a scene where Barbara Stanwyck and Dennis Morgan, the two leads, the romantic leads, are in a sleigh being pulled by a horse. And it's winter and they're going by and there's a fence right over there. Um, and then they come around a circle and they're coming into like a courtyard and here's a space in the middle with a big tree growing out of it. And then the sleigh comes around here and stops. And all along here is the front 
of her Connecticut farmhouse. Very elegant, very glamorous. Let's see, Barbara Stanwyck's real. Dennis Morgan is real, the horse is real, and maybe the fence. Everything else has been built or created. The tree looks great, but it isn't real. Now, it doesn't mean they won't use the tree again. That's part of the economics of being able to control and own what you have. Um, you, if you've seen Gone with the Wind, you know that you've stood on the porch steps of Terra while um, uh, Scarlet throws dirt into the face of his Yankee carpetbagger. You know that you go inside on the other side of the door behind her, that you've gone up the steps, there she is. And they, that behind that door is this big foyer with a staircase that goes up. And so it stands on that staircase in one scene and shoots a Yankee soldier in the face. And here's Olivia Hamlin coming down that staircase. And over here in this other room is where they went to, where they had mass. Um, and the family all had mass in the house. And then over there's another room where uh, Scarlett O'Hara's mother is lying in state and she goes over and pulls the draperies off the wall to make herself the only dress that she could possibly make. And so you've been inside Tara. No, you haven't. You have not at all. You've seen a stair and the front door of a house. Um, in a separate location, you've seen the stairway built up and the space they go through underneath, but there, that stairway leads nowhere. There's nothing there. And the same thing with the room, all of it is separate, separate pieces. But how many times did they use that stairway in one movie or another? Did they decorate it differently, turn it in a different direction? Um, those are the kinds of things when we say more in bigger studios, the high ceiling allowed for fabulous camera work. In the movie Singing in the Rain, uh, Gene Kelly has this uh, gotta dance number and it ends with him. Here's Gene Kelly, right down. And behind him are dozens of men and women dancing, that's Broadway thing, and all these bright lights and flicker and all this gorgeous scenery. And Gene Kelly standing here as a person moves right on up fills the entire screen and you know that's him becoming a star now don't you think there's any danger in him falling off a platform no because that high ceiling allowed them to shoot that in reverse so what happens is the camera comes in to begin with, the camera's there where it's supposed to be, Gene Kelly steps in front of it. Now he's just a person, okay? Now the camera zooms back and as it goes, I mean, he's a big person. His face is there, right there. The camera's right on his face. As he moves back, you see his whole body. You see the people behind him. You see the whole thing, singing and dancing. Now, what they do in the movies is they reverse the film. So when they started with his big face, uh, pardon me, when they started with his, um, um, right, when they start with his big face and go to him being small, now they start with him small and going big. There's no danger to him. But you need the room for a camera to be able to to have a boom like that, so high. Citizen Kane is filled with those things. In Citizen Kane, Orson Welles was given free run at RKO Studios, do what he wanted, and he pretty much did. Um, but it's that kind of thing that makes a difference. Now, this is the business acumen we were talking about with these studio heads earlier. They were making wonderful things that they could use again and again and again. Um, just, uh, well, rear screen projections. You've got Cary Grant and Eva Marie Saint sitting in a sports car, driving through the mountains out west. Cary Grant and Eva Marie Saint are sitting in a sports car in a studio, 
the sports car is elevated so men on this side or men on that side can shake it so it looks like it might be moving or turn it so it looks like it's going to be turning actually they don't even turn it Cary Grant turns that but what's behind them is what you think they're driving on the mountains the whole range the road no that's a movie that they shot someplace especially for this the right road right turns all, everything is exactly as they want but that movie is projected on a movie screen backwards so that when you see it you see it right okay um but they're not any place near that and again this is yeah, this is not negative this is not derogatory this is movie making that time. So it gave them the control so that they could do some of the astounding and amazing things they did. Um, I mean, there are just so many places that you cannot take people. Uh, it would have cost an absolute fortune. In the 1940s, um, MGM has Walter Pigeon and Greer Garson and Mrs. Miniver, and it's London being bombed during the Blitz. You suppose they can go to London? First of all, even without a blitz, it would have been such a huge expense. So they built London, but they only built as much as you're gonna see. There's nothing else. Now they also had, besides the studios, they had distribution companies. By that, I mean some, but okay. Paramount makes a movie. They're gonna show it in Alpena. The theater in Alpena is going to send it to Oscoda. The theater in Oscoda is going to send it to Midland. The theater in Midland is going to send it to Indianapolis. Now, how does it get there? Somebody has to be responsible for that. And what they had, they set up their own divisions in their own businesses. And they didn't go out and contract to somebody else to do this. Their MGM, Paramount, all five of those had their own distributors and they would send all the films out and they would send, uh, bring the films back. And consequently, they did not have to pay somebody else to do it. And that was a crucial movie, uh, movement, a crucial element of movies, the ability to get that film out there and to get that film back. They also had these five, um, they owned substantial theater chains. That meant that Warner Brothers owned movie theaters in hundreds of cities in the United States. Now, ordinarily, oh, let's use Bay City. Okay, you know, we'll use Alpena. Alpena is a smaller town. They've got two movie theaters. One's a first run movie theater. Um, and that person in the first run movie theater wants to rent um, Mrs. Miniver, the one I just said, okay? Now he has to pay for it. Sounds simple, isn't it? Of course it is. Now, what if that movie theater in Alpena is already owned by MGM? Then MGM is paying itself to rent the movie because they own the theater. It's that kind of thing, the, the bigger studios, the distribution, the substantial theater chains. And then the thing that most of us, <laughs> most of us enjoy the most, the contract people. These studios were big enough and powerful enough that they contracted, oh, directors, cinematographers, uh, costume designers, builders. They had vocal teachers. Um, they had acting teachers, dancing teachers, uh, singing teachers, speaking and movement teachers who taught these people how to do these things for the film. Debbie Reynolds comes in. Debbie Reynolds earns a um, contest where she becomes Miss Burbank in California. She's 16. And she's offered a screen test. That's part of the thing of becoming Miss Burbank. She's offered a screen test for MGM. Now, Debbie Reynolds sang and danced like Betty Hutton. If you know who she is, she's a wacko crazy woman, but charming and delightful and a lot of fun on, on the screen. 
Um, she goes, they like her. She sings maybe better than the average person does, but not skilled. She dances okay for Miss Lori's dance studio, but not startling by any means. They put her in a few movies. They like her even more and more. Now she starts going to school. She goes to dance school. She goes to singing school. She goes to acting school, literally on, on the lot. She would spend the day going to those different things so that eventually Debbie Reynolds is capable of holding her own on screen with Dean Kelly and Donald O'Connor in Singing in the Rain. Now, you know that Louis B. Mayer, who ran Metro World and Mayer, is not going to let that little girl just flit off and, and make a career for herself. No, he wants her under contract. He paid for her. He wants her. And he's going to get it. Now, that happened regularly all over the place. Not with everybody. But that's a perfectly good example of the kind of thing um, that happened uh, at the studios contracted people. Now, they contracted um, oh, technical people too. But most of the time, somebody like Edith had a costume designer, she would be contracted for, for specific movies. Or she might be contracted to, if there were um, a, a contracted star for the studio, like say um, Betty Davis for Warner Brothers, she might be contracted to do Betty Davis's costumes for five years, six years. Um, the same thing was true with cinematographers, but you want somebody like Greg Tolan. He's the man who photographed Citizen Kane. And if you look for credits, he goes from Citizen Kane to Ball of Fire, another Barbara Stanwyck movie in which she plays a stripper. Uh, and his photography is the same, but totally different. He knows how to create the kind of mood you want and the kind of image you want for Citizen Kane. But then he can get over here in this sassy thing uh, with Stan Rick and with Gary Cooper uh, and a bunch of crazy professors and visually make that delightful. Now, if you could hold Greg Tolan on contract, that'd be good. Chances are, like he did head, you could have contracted him for some movies, but not straight across the board. Now, if you look at these movie studios, oh, well, wait, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. Oh, yes, I did. Okay, I'm in the right spot, sorry. When you look at these movie studios, you can get a general sense, and by general, I mean very general, not specific at all, because MGM did not make many Westerns. Westerns was not its top of, cup of tea, but they had to make some because some people expected them, and Robert Taylor looked pretty good in a buckskin, so they could make money that way. But what would happen is, for instance, Paramount, if I were to give Paramount films a little description, I would say they exuded a sense of class, not necessarily upper class, a sense of class over the other studio. Um, perfectly good if you know Claudette Colbert, a Paramount actress. Think of her movies, even when she's naked in a tub of uh, milk for Cleopatra, Cecil B. DeMille is a silent movie. There's nothing vulgar or obvious about Claudette Colbert. Paulette Goddard, a little more earthy, but still the same kind of thing. Um, leading man, Fred McMurray, okay? Uh, All My Son's Dad. Uh, there's a real sense, Jeanette McDonald, superb singer, Jeanette McDonald, Nelson Eddy. Um, these people were there at Paramount. And they, I don't mean to say they didn't have fun at Paramount. Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, Dorothy L'Amour, Betty Hutton. They had crazy zany people doing crazy zany things. But basically, 
when you look at the entire picture of what they produce, Paramount, to me, suggests class. On the other hand, MGM that I was just talking about, opulence, spend more money, make it bigger. It's interesting, I was talking to Judy just before we began, and um, she said how much she likes uh, The Wizard of Oz, an MGM movie with Judy Garland, an MGM child star, who Louis B. Mayer, who ran MGM, decided was too fat. And at about the age of 14, Judy Garland went on a regime for the rest of her time with MGM of diet pills. They controlled what she ate. They controlled breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now that's, we talked about a father image. They could create a father image. And Mayer uh, probably thought to some extent that he was helping her out because if she was going to be a big scar, she couldn't be overweight. But it ruined the woman. She became addicted to pills. She was always popping pills her entire career. Um, <clears throat> however, what you get is The Wizard of Oz. Whoa, what a movie. Opulent, so big, so huge, so wonderful. You get that from MGM all the time. MGM had a photograph taken. It had 67 contract players in it. And it was labeled more stars than the heavens. Now there are lots of names I could mention that you wouldn't know, but there's Catherine Hepburn. See, oh, Louis V. Mayer is in the middle. There's Catherine Hepburn. There's Hedy Lamar. There's Lana Turner. There's Spencer Tracy. There's Robert Taylor. There's a multitude of really famous stars who appear in MGM movies, but Louis B. Mayer has such control over them. And I'll get to why and how in just a moment. But let's give him another father image. Besides Judy Garland, Louis B. Mayer loved Greer Garson, an English actress, red haired, very much a proper lady. So he took care of her. He cultivated movies for her. He searched to find the right thing that she could perform in. So she gets Goodbye Mr. Chips and she gets Mrs. Miniver. Uh, she gets things selected for her. And when she starts to get too old, he finds another red haired English actress called Deborah Carr and in she comes to sort of replace Greer Garson as she goes. I don't know what kind of father image that is, but I have the feeling he thought he was doing the right job. Warner Brothers, grit. If I were to say Warner Brothers had anything, it's grit. There was a time in the 30s when they were called the gangster studio. James Cagney, Humphrey Bogart, Edward G. Robinson, Betty Davis, Ann Sheridan, Ida Lupino, all very substantial performers. Not that they couldn't play something lighter, but rarely did they. And frequently when they did, not that they could seem out of place, it just wasn't what we expected. And what we expected was a lot because you went to see Betty Davis in a Betty Davis movie. That's what you expected. And if you didn't get it, you were unhappy. And unhappy means that you might not buy tickets again. So all of these stars are cultivated. Now they are frequently, and I don't want to get too far off track there. Um, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Okay, let me go. Paramount, classy. MGM, opulent. Warner Brothers, gritty. 20th Century Fox, none of the above. And all of the above. They were one of the most even keeled, if you see what goes on there. And to give you an example of what I mean by even keel, 20th Century Fox had Alice Faye. I don't know if you know her or not, but she gave way to Betty Grable. Betty Grable, charming light, not much of a dramatic actress, 
Sonia Henney, an Olympic skate. They hire them, create movies for them, create movies for this woman who is an ice skater. Even the orchestra they hired that they just plugged into movie after movie after movie, Glenn Miller. Nice, even, comfortable, very satisfactory American place. Now, I don't mean to say they skipped out on the drama or the powerhouse. Um, Susan Hayward made big changes for uh, 20th Century Fox. And at a certain point in the late 40s, uh, she won an Oscar with those changes that she made in her own career, going to Daryl Zanuck, the head of Fox, and uh, plugging away to get to do um, these um, these special movies. Um, um, I'll Cry Tomorrow, uh, I Want to Live. I'll Cry Tomorrow, both of them Oscar nominations. Uh, I Want to Live, an Oscar winner for her. They also, at 20th Century Fox, did some social movies. Um, Pinky. Pinky stars Jean Crane and Ethel Waters. If you don't know Ethel Waters, she's a superb Black actress, superb Black singer. Ethel Waters is Jean Crane's grandmother. Now, Jean Crane is Caucasian. Okay, totally. In real life, she's Caucasian. But her grandmother is African-American in the movie. Now, there's a new doctor in town and Jean Crane, before she came to this Southern town with grandma, she was in the North. She became a nurse. Now, she's down here visiting grandma and over here is a new doctor in town. There's even a romance, but she is now a mulatto is the term was used at the time passing herself off as white. Very serious movie for the 40s. 20th Century Fox did that. They did one with anti-Semitism. Gregory Peck, Dorothy McGuire, Gregory Peck writes, he's a writer for a newspaper. He decides he wants to see how anti-Semitic the United States is. He passes himself off as a Jew and he travels the country, reporting, recording, and then reporting all the anti-Semitic uh, Semitic, um, response that he gets. Tough stuff for the middle of the 40s. And Daryl Zanuck didn't back off from it. It's a little clean. It's not really dirty. It's not really super tough, but it's there when other studios were not doing it. But 20th Century Fox was. I don't want to make them holy. Charlie Chan was also there. Charlie Chan was a, an um, Asian, Detective, it's a series. Charlie Chan goes to um, Hawaii. Charlie Chan goes to New York. Charlie Chan in Virginia. Um, and Charlie Chan was almost always played, there were a couple actors, but the prominent actor was a, a Swedish actor with Asian makeup. His son was played by Key Lu, an actual Asian. Tons of those movies, people flocked to them and made money for it. Uh, 20th Century Fox, but it was a money-making industry. So while at one hand you get, I want to live, um, on the other hand, you get Charlie Chan goes on vacation. RKO Studios, what are you gonna get if you see RKO up there? Well, today uh, you have to look back. They were, um, I guess I'd have to say oddball. You could expect anything. King Kong, the original King Kong, comes from RKO. Now, you may say, oh, King Kong, that's so terrible. It is not. You're talking about 1931, I think it is. And you're talking about an 18-inch doll that they moved to create that ape. You're talking about things that you're used to. Today, we are used to computer-generated images, and that's very nice, but they didn't have it back then. And I used to show a movie to begin my movies classes. It was called Life Goes to the Movies, Life Magazine, stuff about movies. But what I always showed it for was Shirley MacLaine was the narrator. She ended that movie by looking at the camera and saying, when you judge a movie, 
you must judge it by the time period it was made. Because the values, the capabilities, everything about that movie is there in the movie. You can't use your standards today to judge that movie accurately. Okay, so um, that's um, RKO. Now, Columbia is my, I think, my favorite movie studio because you never knew what you're going to get. Columbia had um, some really splendid performers with it in it. Uh, but the thing I want to point out about Columbia it comes out best through a director called Frank Capra. Frank Capra started out, made a couple movies. They were pretty good movies. Uh, they gave him uh, the go ahead to make a movie called Ladies of Leisure. He's looking for a leading actress. Um, he couldn't find one. Barbara Stanwyck had gone from Broadway to Hollywood with her husband, who was a Broadway star. And nobody in Hollywood knew Stanwyck. They all knew her husband, Frank Fay. But she had done a screen test at Columbia. And um, it was difficult, but they got Frank Capra to see it. She was a huge success. He was a huge success. Frank Capra went on and on and on, uh, made five movies with Stanwyck, uh, lots of movies, Gene Arthur. Frank Capra is responsible for Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And this one, which is why I say you can expect anything to come from Columbia. It happened one night. It happened one night. Finally, was a movie with Claudette Colbert and Clark Gable, all right? It's about a society daughter who can't stand all the fuss and runs away. It's about a newspaper reporter who recognizes her. They are on a bus traveling somewhere. What it all narrows down to is they have to spend the night in a cabin together. Now this is before motel. So you would rent a tourist cabin. And in that, well, you can't because of the censorship, the studio's taking care of it. You can't have these two people sleeping in separate beds, but you can't have them exposed to each other. So they hang a blanket across the rope, which they call the walls of Jericho. Now, if you know anything um, about the Bible, you probably know that um, Joshua uh, blew down the walls of Jericho with his trumpet. So the audience is always waiting for the walls of Jericho to drop. They never do. Okay, they don't drop. Um, Clark Gable takes off his shirt at one time and He's there with a naked chest. Now she can't see him because she's on the other on the walls of Jer on the other side of the walls of Jericho. But the American public saw him. Now at that time, in the United States, men wore undershirts, not t-shirts, no sleeves, straps. They're called wife beaters today, but I think it's an ugly term. But they wore undershirts. He took off his shirt. Everyone expected him to be wearing one. He wasn't. He was bare chested. The bottom dropped out of undershirts for about two or three years. They just were no longer as popular as they had been. That shows you the star power of Clark Gable. Now, what I'm getting to with this whole movie is Claudette Colbert was the third or fourth actress it was offered to. Others just turned it down, turned it down, turned it around. Clark Gable is a star from MGM. This movie's being made at Columbia. Clark Gable is one of the biggest stars at MGM. However, Daddy Louis B. Mayer is mad at Clark for not behaving. So Daddy Louis B. Mayer sends son Clark Gable over to Columbia to be in a piece of junk because it wouldn't be as grand as MGM made. This is one of the only three movies that has ever won the top five Academy Awards. Best picture, best actor, best actress, best director, best, best screenplay. Now, in addition to that, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and uh, Silence of the Lambs. But this is what I'm saying. I just love Columbia. 
things come out of there all the time. Rita Hayworth came out of there and she's well worth loving. Um, she was interesting because Harry Cohn, who was supposed to be one of the toughest, most miserable studio heads, um, had her as his love goddess. I don't mean personally, I mean for the studio. She was always in sexy movies. She was always looking gorgeous. Um, he, um, he didn't do a lot of musicals and uh, not an overly um, great uh, amount of technicolor, but he did with Rita Hayworth. Um, now, when Rita Hayworth started to go, it was like Greer Garson was being replaced by Deborah Carr. All of a sudden, Harry Kong brings in, he just chooses a woman under contract at the studio. This well-built, good-looking blonde, he gives her a name of Kim Novak. And she is there to be a threat to Ava Gardner. If you don't tow the line, she's going to take your place. Well, Hayworth didn't care. I said Ava Gardner, didn't I? I didn't mean that. Hayworth didn't care because she was dating the Aga Khan. Um, not the Aga Khan, that's his father, the Ali Khan. Extremely, she married him eventually, extremely wealthy people from the Middle East. So Kim Novak becomes a star because Harry Kong couldn't get keep Rita Hayworth as his star anymore. It's that playing back and forth. They're contract players, but Hayworth also knows her value. Now, I've got to go back to Warner Brothers for this contract thing. So you've got to give credit to some people at Warner Brothers. The first, there, these major studios had what were seven year contracts. You would sign for seven years to be under contract to the studio. They would tell you what movies to make. They would do what they wanted with you, okay? You'd be costumed the way they wanted you costumed. You would ride the color horse they wanted you to ride. You'd sing and dance if they wanted you to sing and dance for seven years. Now, one of the first to actually I could go to Barbara Stanwyck, but I won't do that for Kay. One of the first to disagree with that was Betty Davis at Warner Brothers. So she said to Jack Warner, I'm not going to do it. Okay, you're on leave. Which meant she couldn't work anywhere because she was under exclusive contract to Warner Brothers, which meant Warner Brothers did not have to pay her, which meant if However long she's off, if she's off two weeks or three months, it's added to the end of that seven-year contract. So she still has seven years. Now that happened early on with Barbara Stanwyck. I think, I think maybe to Columbia, she got a three-year contract, exclusive. That was the last one she ever signed. She would sign three-year contracts, but they were never exclusive. She wanted to work anywhere she wanted. Now, the woman who made the difference was a good friend of Betty Davis. And that's Olivia de Havilland. Now, what you have to understand is that these people are all different. Olivia de Havilland's father was ambassador to Japan. She came from a background of politics. When she wanted out and she said, this is just wrong. This is indentured servitude to add that time to the end of the contract. So what you wound up with was Olivia de Havilland did didn't take it to court. When, every, when the court found in favor of Jack Warner, she took it higher and higher until that kind of contract, you could not add the time to the end anymore. Big difference for lots of people, tremendously big difference for lots of uh, star performers. Now we'll quickly go through the other two studios, Universal, to me, they're horror movies. Oh, they did not all horror movies, but that's Boris Karloff in Frankenstein. That's Lon Chaney in Dracula. That's not Lon Chaney, Bela Lugosi. Lon Chaney Jr. in The Werewolf. Um, the Mummy is in there somewhere. There's just absolute loads of um, uh, horror movies that come, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Uh, now, they still have, to their credit, All's Quiet on the Western Front, superb movie, uh, anti-war movie that won an Oscar as Best Picture of the Year when it was made in the 30s. Okay, I give you that, so now you have some idea of what you can expect from the studios. You can go from classy 
to opulent, to uh, gritty, to pretty even keel with Warner Brothers. Who knows what you're going to get when it comes to RKO. Um, it, if you get it before um, Howard Hughes took over in 1949, you'd be lucky. But now let's get to the people they have under contract that we're interested in. I forgot to punch my clock. I've been talking too long. Okay, well, I'll hurry. Um, what time did I start? Two o'clock? Oh, good Lord. Well, you can turn on. So you're still fine. Um, I want to talk about movie stars, but there are too many of them. So what I'm doing is I'm choosing some. I'm choosing John Wayne, Gary Cooper, Henry Fonda, James Stewart, Humphrey Bogart, Clark Cable, Spencer Tracy. You see, you like them. Oh, you don't like them, doesn't matter. But you like their image. You like what you see on the screen. And that image in a lot of cases is very cultivated. They're not like that at all. Rita Hayworth used to say, it's terrible. I go to bed with, uh, Rita Hayworth goes to bed with a man and he wakes up with me because she was not glamorous. She made no effort to be glamorous. She was not egotistical. None of those things, most down to earth. She was Margarita Casino, which was her name before it was changed when she danced uh, with her father's uh, flamenco company. She never got put on those airs. Um, so when we look at those men, let's look at John. I'd like you to compare John Wayne to Clark Gable. I think their style of acting is pretty much the same. They're very reserved. You don't get a lot. John Wayne is stoic. Read the biography that his second son wrote about him. That image of John Wayne was totally cultivated. John Wayne knew what it was. He insisted it went to his movies. Uh, one of his prime directors, John, uh, John Ford, uh, made sure that they were in there. This was the image because people wanted a John Wayne movie. Now, what's interesting is that his studio kept him out of going into the military during World War II. Henry Fonda went, James Stewart went, Robert Taylor went, Gary Cooper. Yes, Gary Cooper went, not John Wayne. So John Wayne made sure that he took that image of the strong silent type and it was there in movie after movie as he fought the Japanese and the Germans in the film. That was his patriotic service to our country so that citizens could feel, could see what their soldiers were doing overseas. Now, compare him to Clark Gable. Clark Gable is always quiet, but he lets a little smile in now and then or a little gleam in the eye. It's interesting that they cultivated similar things, but dissimilar. Let me tell you this, it's an old acting thing done um, in the um, 1890s in Russia. Uh, an acting teacher had a large table put out with a tablecloth on it, had a chair with arms put at the head of it, had a man sit in that chair, middle-aged man sit in the chair and stare forward at the table with nothing on but the tablecloth takes a picture. Then he superimposes different things on that tablecloth. And he superimposes a baby and shows that picture of the man looking at the baby. People said, oh, how, how you could tell how much he loved that child. You could tell how dear that grandchild or whatever kind of child it was to him. A turkey. I mean, a full meal with a turkey in the middle and all the stuff around. You could tell how starving the man was. He was so hungry. Well, you couldn't tell anything because he just sat with there with a plain face. You read into that what you wanted to see. You read into that what you wanted to know. So when John Wayne or Clark Gable are stoic, quiet faces, all that has to happen is Wayne just squints and you will read into that squint whatever you want to read 
Gable just smirks at the corner of his mouth. And you'll read into that whatever you want to read. I'm going to use Barbara Stanwyck twice, not for her, but for two men. She made a movie with Gary Cooper called Ball of Fire. And he is a professor who's writing a dictionary, an encyclopedia. She's a stripper I mentioned. She made the movie I mentioned also called The Lady Eve with Henry Fonda, where they're on the chaise lounge. Now, that's Gary Cooper in a comedy of sort of border, not silly, but so, not serious comedy. Um, that's Henry Fonda in a, a slightly more serious comedy. But then compare Gary Cooper to his role in High Noon where he plays the marshal, abandoned by his deputy, abandoned by the city. And at high noon, they're coming off the train after him. And he's alone to defend that city. Compare Henry Fonda lying there next to Barbara Stanick on the floor. Well, I wish I could say the same to um, Tom, I think it's Tom Jode at the end of The Grapes of Wrath. Brilliant performance. A man so still and so mad at the world. These are the kinds of things now that are there, but again, it's because of the image you expect to see. You seldom will see any of those people different. Bogart, he played some romantic leads, but most of the time Bogart is tough. Whether he is in Sabrina and Audrey Hepburn is going to wind up to be his girl. And he's only about 25 or 30 years older than she is when he makes the movie. Um, but the catch is he is still, it's a comedy. It's still lightweight, but he is playing a man in charge. Something very comfortable for Bogart's image. You see the same thing with Spencer Tracy. Spencer Tracy, do you know what I mean if I say you hit your mark? Okay, Spencer Tracy said, learn your lines, be on time, hit your mark. That meant, in order for you to cross a room and be in the right place for the camera to get you, there's a mark on the floor. Most actors made a real effort not to look at the mark, but to be able to get it in their peripheral vision, vision and stop in the right place. Spencer Tracy would walk, he'd look down, and then he'd stop. He did it all the time. You can see him do it in movies. It looks totally natural. But Spencer Tracy is the most minimal actor. You see so little going on. But the eyes tell you a lot with Spencer Tracy. This is the kind of thing that you get. There are images. And like that person looking at that baby that didn't exist, you can take the James Stewart and you can take James Stewart and in a very dramatic scene, have him lower his eyes and turn his head. And you'll read into that, the drama that they want you to read. Same thing, the ladies, I look at Catherine Hepburn, Betty Davis, uh, Joan Crawford, Barbara Stanwyck, Greta Garbo, Claudette Colbert. Greta Garbo was always, I don't know if you've ever seen her movies. I think she's amazing. I didn't expect to. I didn't see her until I was 20. And I saw her in Camille. And I have to tell you, it's true. They say the camera's in love with Greta Garbo. Wherever she turns, whatever she does, she's gorgeous. She's not gorgeous. Well, that, that's a matter of taste, but she's unflawed. Her nose isn't too big. Her cheekbones aren't too high. Her mouth isn't too wide. She is just perfect for that camera. Um, Catherine Hepburn's father was a physician. Her mother was a suffragette. Catherine Hepburn went to Bryn Mawr, which is for women in Ivy League College, okay? She went to the movies, an educated, independent woman, and nobody pushed Catherine Hepburn around. Now, Betty Davis spent a little bit of time at the uh, Murray Anderson School of Acting 
in New England, but she was a New England woman. And she came to Hollywood with her mother and her mother kept strict tabs on her and what was happening. Davis also being an, an well, she always said she was proud to be a Yankee, which means New England. Um, but she was, she had that Yankee attitude, straight at you, straightforward. Take someone like Joan Crawford, by the time she was 16, she was dancing in nightclubs in um, Texas, uh, picking up any kind of work, dancing anywhere. Uh, it wasn't until she finally got to Hollywood at like 18, and she was in a movie called um, Your Dancing Daughters, in which she danced at Charleston, and all of a sudden she was noticeable. She has no background. Barbara Samick has no background. She was orphaned at eight and grew up in foster homes and was uh, in the Ziegfeld Follies uh, downtown uh, when she was 17 or 18. They don't have those things to call on. All I'm saying is that when you know those things about them, you can see Stan because always there's a slight, I don't want to say hard edge, because Davis will give you a hard edge. Hepburn will give you a hard edge. But there's a no nonsense. Stanwick's in charge of herself. Well, the other women are too. But Stanwick can't get rid of her. The same way Crawford can't get rid of her. Pretty much Davis can't, but Hepburn can. Hepburn can play light comedy. Philadelphia story. Um, bringing up baby. But she's also a Broadway actress who has a lot of training. So you, you wind up with all these things happening with these people with created images. I said Cla Claudette Colbert, Paramount Class, when she was going to make that movie at Columbia, there's a scene where she's supposed to pull up her skirt and a truck stops so they can get a ride. She's hitchhiking. But Clark Gable isn't getting anybody with his thumb. She puts her leg out, pulls up her skirt, not very high, a couple inches above the knee, uh, and the truck stops. She didn't want to do that. That wasn't ladylike. Um, these images that they have carry through into what you get and the studio develops it. Now you also get stars who are symbols. Kim Novak becomes a sex symbol. Not much of an actress for the most part, but the camera makes, does it all. If she needs so happy, all she has to do is smile and the camera will capture that. And they can put glycerin in her eyes beforehand if they want to sparkle. All of those things can happen. Marilyn Monroe, really underwritten frequently as being just a sex symbol. She does some excellent work. You want to see what I consider her best work? Watch, you see the movie Bus Stop. But she plays somebody like Marilyn Monroe. The audience isn't disappointed, but she gets to act within that framework. She gets to act within um, that image, which is a Marlena Dietrich, what was she? She was legs. Forever, but a remarkable woman, truly remarkable woman. Um, in Witness for the Prosecution, she is superb, including playing two roles. Well, I just blew it for you. Well, too bad. Um, pretend you didn't hear me. But she is disguised as another character. And even though I knew it as a play before I saw the movie, oh, next to impossible to know that's Marlene Dietrich next to impossible. Um, you get, as I said, Rita Hayworth, she's a sex symbol, Lana Turner. Well, she was originally, she was originally called the sweater when she went under contract to MGM, if that tells you the image, and that never left. <clears throat> You'll see she can be in the most dramatic show ever, and her figure and her good looks are always prominent, but she was with MGM again. So what I'm trying to suggest is that when you are looking for a movie or considering uh, watching TCM, you can get some clues um, from the studio and the image of the person. Now, sometimes it's hard. You wouldn't be able to figure out all the images. I just want to tell you that they're there so that when you watch one movie to another, you can look to see them. Okay, this is the kind of actor Robert Mitchum is. <coughs> Pardon me. Roger Mitchum is an unfussy, straightforward actor. You always get that. 
Um, on the other hand, Fred McMurray, so unusual. He is my three sons, Mr. Flubber on television. But he plays three of the best, three of the best roles in his career are villains. In Double Indemnity with Stanwyck, in the K Mutiny Court Martial, in which he institutes a mutiny that somebody else is going to be called, hauled in for, and in the apartment where he is just a sleaze bag using Jack Lemon's apartment for sleaze bag things. Superb. Not, but he plays them the same way. Totally understated. No over the top work. You know McMurray, you know that you're going to see it, but you're going to see it used in a different way. And then, of course, the Mavericks. I'll give you the one Maverick, and that's Orson Welles. You never know what you're going to get. Sometimes it's superb. Citizen Kane, superb. On the other hand, um, well, people are supposed to like it, but Touch of Evil, I think, stinks. Uh, Third Man, really good, really interesting. And his hand is in all of them. It's in the writing, it's in the directing, it's in the lighting. And the last Maverick I'll go, well, go with is Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock began his career in Germany. He worked in German studios, editing film at a time when German studios were turning out the most bizarre expressionistic movies, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, um, mm. Metropolis, M, movies you don't know what I'm talking about, but they were off the charts for weird or strange or different from what anybody else was doing. Then he leaves Germany, he goes to England, he's doing the same thing, finally gets around to directing. As he gets around to directing, he has a background of how to be scary. For instance, he makes certain mistakes. Um, Hitchcock always said, if you want to, who are you scaring? The audience. If you want the audience to be scared, show them the thing to be scared of. Don't keep it a secret. Don't have a hidden bomb go, Bleh! and for one moment, they're shocked. No, show the audience the bomb under the table right away. Show the people coming in, sitting at the table, the waiter's feet almost touching it. Show all these things over and over. And the audience is waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for it to go off. That is scary. And that was a Hitchcock touch that he carried for a long time. I lost a little bit of interest in Hitchcock after Psycho, I love Psycho, but he moved into these technicolor movies, North by Northwest, Rear Window, all of those. Stories are interesting a lot, but there's so much that's visually fake that I just have a hard time buying into it. I know I can't help it when I look and see Rear Window, I know that's all a set on a studio. I can't see it any other way. Maybe it's lighting, maybe it's whatever it is. Um, when um, uh, um, when oh okay I'll hit you with this and then I'll be about finished except suggesting how you can get some good stuff from TCM um, you remember Cary Grant hangs off Abraham Lincoln's nose in North by Northwest Alfred Hitchcock I said learned some things in Saboteur, a wonderful actor who just died, and I can't think of his last name, Norman, Norman, Norman. He is the bad guy, and they are in the crown of the Statue of Liberty. And the bad guy is hanging there with um, Robert Cummings up above, reaching for him and trying to save him. And he doesn't, and the bad guy falls to his death. And Hitchcock found out nobody cared. He's a bad guy. What are you saving him for anyway? And he learned you never do that. He also learned through a bad example, you never kill children, which he had a child blown up in the bomb one time. He should have put somebody else next to the bomb on the bus. Now, if you, uh, I have, um, 
spectrum um, silver and I get TCM. That's 24 seven movies all day long, every single day. Some of them very organized for you, some not. If you wanna know what's playing, go to TCM online. You can get two things. You can one, get a magazine. Now the magazine's a video magazine, but it will come up on your screen. You can see what's going on all the time. They will also do it by two sections the first of the month and the 15th of the month. And they will list every film that, that's coming up. And they list descriptions with them too. Well, not with all of them, but with a good deal of them. Um, it's uh, no cost to go to TCM and get those listings uh, sent to you. Um, <clears throat> with my silver, I can also go to On Demand. And this is the cool thing. If you go to On Demand, I have to tell you how to do it. I don't want to make a mistake. If you go to On Demand, you hit on it, then hit on Free Movies, then hit on TCM, then hit on, um, and then TCM will come up and you'll have a list of the movies they're currently showing. And that they have shown, well, last time I counted was 58 movies and they change them all the time. Well, I'm sorry, I've run off at the mouth so long, half an hour longer than I expected to. Uh, thank you for staying and hanging out. And I hope you have uh, your, old golden, your own golden years uh, with, um, with TCM and uh, enjoy your movies. Thanks for coming. Thank you. You did an awesome job. Thank you.